this is the first uh, uh, of our new series, Voices uh, uh, for a Sustainable Future. Uh, the seminar series is part of uh, the USC Solutions Lab, which is a new activity that we are launching that really aims to foster uh, interdisciplinary environmental and sustainability research on campus. Uh, we are very happy that you're all here. Uh, and I want to start by saying this is a, an activity that again, with the intent of bringing many uh, of you from different departments and schools on campus, was sponsored by several partners. We have the Wrigley Institute here uh, presented. We have the Schwarzenegger Institute, uh, the, 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 the Price School, uh, and uh, vari various other, uh, other partners, uh, including from uh, Dornsife and the College of Engineering. Uh, we will meet uh, every so often throughout the academic year, uh, focusing primarily on uh, what we consider are the great sustainability challenges. And we've invited inspirational speakers with the idea that they would discuss with us some of those global challenges, but also start articulating potential solutions uh, to move uh, forward. Um, as you will learn more about this activity, we also encourage you to write to us with suggestions for future speakers because the seminar series is uh, for you. Uh, so with that, um, I want to introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, who is Professor Ravi Kambur. So Professor Ravi Kambur is the TH Lee Professor of uh, uh, Economics at, uh, at Cornell University. He's actually one of my uh, former colleagues. Uh, we thought of him as the first speaker and the inaugural speaker for the seminar series because he was also uh, recently the chair of the intergovernmental panel, um, the International Panel for Social Progress, which was um, uh, a panel that convened uh, several hundred scholars from around the world precisely to identify and put forward solutions for some of the global challenge that we are seeing in society. And so, uh, because there is obviously a tremendous um, intersection between sustainability challenges and many other challenges that are happening in simultaneous, we felt that this was a very good starting point for, uh, for our conversation. And so we've asked Professor Cambor to uh, give some introductory remarks. He will tell you a little bit about uh, some of um, the activities of this uh, uh, international panel. It will focus on a few topics of the panel, but then most of uh, uh, what will follow will actually be a discussion uh, with Q&A from you um, and, and the speakers. So with that said, thank you very much, Rafi, for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction, Antonio, and thanks to you all for coming. It's a uh, <clears throat> it's an honor and a pleasure to be, to be here uh, uh, speaking to you. Uh, what we'll do is I'll, I'll uh, say a few words about something called the International Panel on Social Progress, uh, and then I'll <clears throat> introduce some issues. But I hope to finish fairly quickly so that we can have uh, some discussion. Uh, for those of you who want more detail, uh, you can go to my, my website, uh, and there are sort of papers galore on, that, on, that, uh, on, on the site. Uh, so let's uh, <clears throat> get going. The, my title is Sustainability of Progress and in Institutional Innovation. So what I want to do, that there's the outline. So I want to talk about the International Panel on Social Progress. I'll then uh, touch on some of the anxieties of our age. I'll talk about the chasms which we face, uh, at least some of them. And then uh, talk briefly about institutional innovations uh, that the, that we can then discuss uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the discussion period. So here's the International Panel on Social Progress. <clears throat> That's the website, ipsp.org. It's quite a, quite a remarkable uh, uh, sequence of, uh, of events, actually. There are more than 300 scholars involved. Uh, it uh, constitutes all disciplines, uh, social sciences and, and humanities, uh, from all continents. There's going to be a first report uh, uh, in 2018, but actually all the draft chapters are on the website, so uh, students, it's a great, great resource, uh, and you'll see what the chapters are. There are 22 chapters, and they're all covering almost everything you can, you can, you can imagine. Actually, for faculty as well, there are good, great bibliographies in, the, uh, in there. 
And then uh, there's, a, there's a website with uh, downloadable drafts, comments. If you want to comment, you can, you can comment. Uh, and there are video interviews of the authors and so on. <clears throat> so what are the objectives of this panel? It's sort of comprehensive coverage of many dimensions of social progress. Uh, to make social science more accessible and relevant to a, to a broader audience. Uh, to feed social activists and citizens with ideas about possible futures. And also to raise interest in social justice uh, among thinkers and actors, social actors. That's a sort of broad objective. So again, let me just say who it is. It's 300 plus scholars, including Antonio Bento, who's one of the lead authors of the chapter on, on environment and growth. Uh, the advisory committee is headed by Nobel laureate Amatya Sen. Uh, I'm, the co I'm a co-chair of the Scientific Council, which is uh, the co-chairs are Nancy Fraser, myself, and Helga Nowotny. Nancy Fraser is a philosopher. Helga, is, uh, Helga Nowotny is a sociologist. There's a steering committee headed by Olivier Bouin and Marc Flaubert. Olivier is from the Collège d'Études in France, and Marc Flaubert is a professor at Princeton. There are dozens of academic institutions involved, including Cornell, and lots of, lots of foundations as well. So what are the topics that are covered in this report? <clears throat> well, first of all, there's trends and compass, what do we mean by social progress? Uh, the, then there's a discussion of social economic transformations on inequality, sustainability, cities, labor, uh, 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 coverage of governance and politics, values and cultures on religion, families, and so on. Very comprehensive indeed. And here's a list of chapters. There are 22 of them. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, but you can see that part one is socioeconomic transformations, where issues of inequality, economic growth, uh, cities, etc., covered. Part two is political issues, regulation, governance. Part three is values, norms, and cultures, family, uh, 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 belonging, solidarity, and so on, and then some concluding chapters. So back to my outline. So that's the introduction to the International Panel on Social Progress. Please do go to the website and, uh, and have a look, ipsp.org. I think you'll find it a useful resource. I now want to turn to, why, to a, a basic motivation for this panel, which is the anxieties of our age. You must all know that we face tremendous anxieties in our age. Here's a quote. I wonder if you recognize where it's from. <clears throat> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. Who's that by? The opening, obviously, it's the opening, it's the opening paragraph to the a Tale of Two Cities, essentially describing the period up, running up to the French Revolution. Okay. I think it actually matches rather well uh, uh, right now. Okay. So that's the point. The, the, we are in an age which is described by that. And what I want to do is to look at whether we are indeed in the best of times or the worst of times. And you know, in many aspects, the world as a whole is really uh, the, last, the last three quarters of a century after the Second World War has indeed been a period of the best of times. No question about it. First of all, there's been no global con conflagration since the Second World War. You know, it took a thousand years up to 1950 for the world per capita GDP, but per capita income, to multiply by 15. It took 60 years for it to multiply by a factor of four between 1950 and 2008. In 1978, China's per capita GDP was roughly twice its level in the year 1000. But in 30, uh, 30 years after that, it grew by sixfold in value. It's in real terms, okay? Uh, at independence in 1947, uh, 70 years ago, India's per capita GDP was 20% above its value one, after 1,000 years before. During the next 60 years, it increased almost fivefold. Yeah. Best of times, best of times. Global poverty, as we conventionally measure it, and we can discuss the technical details and so on, but using the World Bank poverty line, uh, fell by 42% of the world's population being below the World Bank global poverty line to 11% in 2013. Life expectancy has increased from just above 50 years in 1960 to 70 years, half a century later. And this was underpinned by a, fall in infant, in, a quite spectacular fall in infant, infant mortality from 120 to 30. Still very high, but a quarter of what it was 50 years before. Best of times, and yet. And yet, there's no question that the sense of anxiety in our times is palpable. Okay? 
uh, I can just go through the, go through the list. Okay? I won't mention Trump, uh, Brexit, Scottish independence, Catalan independence, far-right properties in West, uh, uh, parties in Western Europe, subversion of democracy in Eastern Europe, conflict and threats to democracy in Africa, Hindu fundamentalism in India, Islamic fundamentalism in the Middle East, Buddhist fundamentalism in Myanmar and in Sri Lanka. Okay? Uh, states in conflict, refugee flows, South China Sea conflicts, North Korea, etc. And then uh, coming to uh, uh, topics which are close to the heart of many people here, environmental damage, climate volatility, extreme weather events, etc. So you see, we've, we've come all this way, and suddenly we're anxious. So we've built this sort of 50-story uh, building uh, meticulously over the last 75 years, and now it looks as though we're going to fall, uh, fall off the top. What's going on? What's going on? And I want to take up some specific topics to discuss that. And all of these anxieties, and more actually t covered in different bits of the report. The 22 chapters cover different aspects of these. And what they paint, what the picture they paint, is one of undoubted progress upwards, okay? but of huge chasms facing us. Uh, uh, and, and they also try to come up with some solutions as to uh, some sort of institutional innovations uh, for, these, for these chasms. And the point is that there be no doubt that the progress of the last 75 years should not lull, lull us into a false sense of security. Okay. Here's another quote. I wonder if you'll guess who this is, where this is from. What an extraordinary ex episode in the, in the economic progress of man that age was, which came to an end in, I, I put the XXXs in, so that otherwise you'd guess where it was from. Okay. Escape was possible at that time into the middle and upper classes for whom life offered at a low cost and with the least trouble conveniences, comforts, and amenities beyond the compass of the richest and most powerful monarchs of other ages. The projects and politics of militarism and imperialism, of racial and cultural rivalries, of monopolies, restrictions, and exclusion, which were to play the serpent to this paradise, were little more than the amusements of the daily newspaper, and appeared to exercise almost no influence at all on the ordinary course of social and economic life, the internationalization of which was nearly complete in practice. Right, can anybody? Say who that was. Hmm? It's a hard one, yes. It's, it wasn't Charles Dickens, no. It was, jo it was, it was John Maynard Keynes uh, in his famous book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And the XXX is August 1914. It's when the First World War started. So Keynes is describing the previous 70 years, pre the previous half century of untrammeled progress as, they, as he saw it. And it came to a shuddering halt in 1914. So I, what, I can't, what I can't do is, of course, cover everything that's in the report and all these things. What I want to do is to focus on three potential chasms. Uh, one is inequality. The second is environment and climate. And the third is a nation state. Okay. I'll say least about environment and climate because you know, the expertise is in the room rather than, rather than with me. But I will say a few things about inequality and about the nation state. So let's talk about inequality. Inequality is also, I would say, a best of times, worst of times story. But, I, I, but ultimately, I believe that we are facing a chasm. Why is this? Now, I don't want to go into the technical details of how inequality is measured and the, how, the survey data that you use and so on. If there are any technical questions, I'm happy to answer during the discussion time. Okay? But just think intuitively that if one just apply the intuitive standard of the gap between the rich and the poor. You have all sorts of indices like the Gini coefficient and so on. But essentially, it's an intuitive measure of the gap between the top and the bottom. But if you take that as an intuitive measure, I, th I believe a fairly consistent story emerges over the last, uh, over the last uh, 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 decades about global trends and patterns. What is that story? Well, the story is, as all of you know, that inequality in the US fell for 35 years after the Second World War. And after that, it started rising and has risen inexorably. And all of you know about that. Inequality has also risen in the UK, in parts of Europe, China, India, uh, Bangladesh, etc. Well, that all looks pretty bad news, uh, assuming you believe that inequality is bad. Uh, what's the good news? It's actually that inequality in Latin America, over the same period of the last 25, 30 years, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, etc., has fallen during this same period. You might ask the question, why? Why has it risen in the US and fallen in Latin America? I'll let you ponder that, and maybe we can come back uh, to it uh, in, in the discussion. There's further good news. China, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, all these developing countries, 
grew faster than the US and the West. China was growing at 10% per year, where the US was growing at 2% per year or less. Okay? So the inequality between countries fell. On average, China was moving closer to the US at a very fast rate. So even though the US was getting more unequal around its average, China was getting more unequal around its average. The average of China was approaching that of the US at the rate of 10 minus 2, 8% per year. That's, that's, a, that's a dimension of global inequality, which was coming down in this period. Okay? So some aspects of inequality, inequality within nations, was going up. Other aspects of inequality, inequality between nations, was coming down. So how did these forces resolve each other in terms of inequality between all citizens of the world? If you were to uh, range everybody in the world from richest to poorest and apply a measure of inequality to that, did that count go up or go down? What do people think? Remember, the inequality within nations is, is rising, except for Latin America, the exception. Inequality between nations is falling. And it's those two forces which are being resolved. Which do you think won? Inequality in the world taken as a whole fell, which may surprise a lot of people. Okay? But remember, it's that, it's that notion of a billion people in China, on average, moving closer to the rich countries, which is driving this, uh, driving this result. Well, so overall, if that is your objective, inequality amongst all the citizens of the world, surely that's good news. What's there to worry about? What's around the corner? Well, the report makes a big thing of this. The big worry, the big worry for the world as a whole is a massive technological trend. And the trend is that of displacing basic labor in favor of skilled labor and capital. This has been going on for the last 20 years. And, it's going to be and it is going to be going on for the next 25, 30 years. And if you leave it unchecked, it's clear what's going to happen. This, the economics of it is quite simple. Okay? It's going to lead to concentration of market income in the hands of the skilled, in the hands of, the ca of capital, and away from basic labor. That's already happening. And there's a big debate as to how much of the rise, for example, how much of the rise in US inequality is accounted for by this type of force rather than other forces. As I said, its manifestations are already felt in the US and the UK, where, together with this toxic blend, uh, it has led to Brexit and to Trump. Think of Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. Now, where these trends have not yet appeared fully, and all, you know, there's a lot of detail in this, of course, and I'm, I'm sort of skipping, the, where these trends have, have, uh, have not yet fully appeared, as in parts of East Asia, or they've been countered by policy, as in Latin America, and we can talk about how they've been countered by policy in Latin America. Okay? There is really no room for complacency. Policymakers in East Asia have actually woken up now to the fact that something is going on. I've just come from Singapore, where they think, you know, uh, surely we're immune from this. No, you're not immune from that. Because, in fact, if you look at the construction sector, which is very big in, in, uh, in uh, Singapore, it's using less and less basic labor using less and less basic labor. And they're aware of these trends and are waking up to those trends in this country. And in countries like Latin America, which have been using policy to, to go against this global trend, they have to keep running to, to stand still, uh, applying those policies more and more and more and more. Okay? So this, to me, is rising inequality. And this, this trend, for even, even though inequality in the world as a whole has fallen in the last 25 years, this fundamental force which is pushing towards rising inequality, we believe in this report, and I believe, is one of the chasms that's facing us, and we have to address the issue. So what can be done about it? And I'll come to that presently when I talk about uh, institutional innovations. Let me talk about chasm two. Again, I, I just simply mention it here and not, not go into the detail, because of course, the, the real, as I said, the real expertise is in this room rather than with me. The spectac uh, uh, chapter four of the report uh, really talks about this. The, the spectacular income growth of the last three quarters of a century has actually, as, again, as you all know, has been built on depleting natural assets, clean air, uh, surface and groundwater, forests, etc. Okay. And as these assets run out, there's a risk that the growth that we've enjoyed, that uh, uh, massive increase in GDP per capita, is going to come to a halt unless somehow technology comes to the rescue but it's the same technology which is leading to those inequality trends that I mentioned uh, uh, previously. Uh, and of course, and I, again, I don't need to emphasize this here, in the case of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, truly frightening scenarios are possible 
where essentially uh, planetary survival is, uh, is threatened. And this is surely one of the monsters that lurks around the corner, is a phrase that we use uh, in, in the report. Uh, and this really belies the best of times of the last 75 years as to what's around the corner. I said, I won't say very much about that, but I want to now turn to the nation state, which to us is a third looming uh, issue in the years to come. Again, as many of you know, the origins of the nation state are usually dated to 1648 uh, with the Peace of West, uh, Westphalia. Essentially, it ended the European wars of religion, but the basic principle of the Westphalian state is one of sovereignty over its territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, so, and the realm of policymaking, internal intervention, etc. That's the fundamental principle of the Westphalian state, sovereignty within your borders, the policies that you want to, you, apl you apply in those policies. And of course, by the time the Second World War ended, the system of nation states was well established. 1648 to 19, you know, it's, it's 300 years, over a period of 300 years, it was very well established. Okay? And it remained the foundation of the post-Second World War order. Of course, albeit with, with a hegemon, namely the US. But actually, the fundamental foundation of policy of the, of the post-Second World War period, all is not well with the nation state. Again, I don't need to uh, go into, uh, to, uh, to say uh, too much about that to you. There are two things. First is the rise of subnational movements under the nation state, okay? uh, asking for greater control over local affairs, uh, Cat uh, Catalonia, uh, even to the point of demanding independence from the sovereign state. Okay? So the basis on which the, po the post-war order was formed is, in, is, so to speak, threatened from the subnational uh, direction. But there's a second one where there's a threat or, or, or a dilution coming from above the nation state, namely from the global side. And what's happened, of course, in the last uh, 75 years, which is related to the best of times arguments about increase in income and all that, is the dramatic rise of transnational economic activity. Flows of goods, investments, people, etc., which the nation state either does not wish to control or cannot control. Uh, we, you've all heard about capital flows, across uh, cross-border capital flows. The point is, if these movements are not fully controlled, they can severely constrain uh, the, uh, the scope of domestic policy making. The governments cannot do what they wish, because if they do some things, then economic activity will leave the country and go elsewhere. Okay. Now, of course, if that's what you wanted, if you wanted not to have control, if you wanted governments not to have control over domestic policy, well and good. If, on the other hand, you want governments to have control because they want to have an influence on inequality and so on and so forth, then this is a problem for you. This is a problem for you. And the inability to control domestic policy then brings into the question the process of democracy itself and, the, uh, and the will of the whether the will of the people is being implemented. And, and I give you some simple but powerful examples of the above. Implementation of domestic tax and redistribution policies, domestic labor and environmental regulation, when economic activity can simply move to other countries. And a race to the bottom can be triggered. And of course, addressing climate change is only one example of a so-called global public good, where you need action beyond the nation state, beyond the nation state. But of course, these agreements are formed from nation states. That's the paradox. You need action above the nation state but the nation state is itself being weakened by uh, these, uh, these things that are going on above the nation state. And these, these are the realities of our time. And the, or the secure order in which we had the last 75 years is now being questioned, is now being undermined because of these forces. So let me now turn to two examples of institutional innovations. Having set out some of the, some of the issues and some of the problems, what do we do about it? In particular, I want to focus on inequality because that's an area that I, that I myself work on. As I said, the fundamental trend that I believe we have to worry about over the next uh, 25, 30, 35 years is this technological trend which is displacing basic labor in favor of skilled labor and capital. If you don't do anything about it, the market distribution of income will be become ever more concentrated in the hands of skilled labor and capital. And you have basic labor left out there. Now, you know, you can say, well, what we've got to do is to train, is to have the, uh, is to train to, for everybody to become a computer programmer and so on and so forth. Well, yes, but that's, that's, that's uh, a strategy that will work for the next generation. The issue that I want to highlight, and the issue that we all, we all know now, 
is the issue of marooned workers. Think about the 40-year-old steel worker, 45-year-old steel worker, either in the US Midwest or in a Chinese state-owned enterprise. Okay? The problem is already there in the Midwest. It's coming in China in the next 15, 20 years. Okay? Now, the notion that somehow you can retrain a 45-year-old steel worker to become a computer programmer is fanciful. Mm -hmm. And yet, this person, these people are going to be with us for the next 35, 40 years. How are we going to maintain social stability in a situation where increasingly market income is going to be concentrated, so to speak, in the hands of the computer programmers and displacement of basic labor is taking place all the time? I think those are the fundamental forces. Of course, there are lots of bells and whistles, and we can talk about the details and so on. It's playing out differently in different countries and so on. But what is a fundamental force that we should be talking about here? And to me, that's, that's, uh, that's certainly one of the most important. <coughs> So what's the issue? The issue to me is that over the next 25, 30 years, the fundamental issue for maintaining social stability is the following. How are you going to reach into the pockets of the computer programmers, get money out, and get it to the unemployed steel worker? Because if you don't, the gap will just go on rising. However you do it, whatever mechanism, that is ultimately what you're going to have to do to maintain social stability. Otherwise, you'll just see this block of maroon workers go down, 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 down. Okay. Now, whether you call it retraining, whether you call it the treating assignment, it has, to be tr it has to be redistribution of some sort from this side to that side. That is the fundamental problematic, in my view, of the next 25 to 30 years. And once you accept, if you accept that, you may not accept it, but if you accept that argument, if you accept that argument, uh, then really there are only two, at least from my point of view, from social science, there are two questions. One is, how do you design these forms of redistribution? There are two questions about how you design these forms of redistribution, and there are only two questions. One is, what is the economic efficiency of different forms of redistribution? How do you minimize the so-called leaky bucket as you try to get money from here to over there? And you know, economists have a lot to say on that. Okay. Uh, and social science has a lot to say. But the second question is, what is the socially acceptable form of redistribution? So what is the economically efficient form of redistribution? And what is the socially acceptable form of redistribution? And our problem for the next 25 to 30 years is going to be that there is not often an intersection between those two. That the economically most efficient forms of redistribution are often not the socially acceptable forms of redistribution. Let me give you, let me give you examples of this. Basic economics tells you <laughs> that if this steel worker has been made unemployed and suppose he, uh, he loses $1,000, basic economics tells you, look, the best way to do it is just write, the, just write him a check for $1,000. Don't try any indirect. The more indirect ways you try, <laughs> the more inefficient it is. The leaky, the leaky buckets multiply as you try to subsidize this. Well, just, just give the $1,000 to this person. Lump sum transfer is the, is the term that economists often use. Okay? That's the most efficient way of doing it. Well, of course, just think of, think of it now from the point of view of the unemployed steel worker. Well, he would rather have $1,000 than not have $1,000, for sure. But it is not enough to get $1,000. It is not enough. That is not considered to be a dignified form of receiving the transfer. That person would rather go into a factory, through the, and in some sense, with the sweat of his brow, get the $1,000. Even if it costs you $2,000 to set up the factory, <laughs> to do all that sort of stuff, okay? Because in the market where steel that's being produced is not valued at all, essentially when the steel comes out of that factory, it's going to be dumped in the sea. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> What's important is, is the form of transfer socially acceptable or not? I just give you that as an example, but there are many, many other examples, okay? So for example, in some countries, means testing of transfers is perfectly okay. It's perfectly OK as an acceptable social, social thing. You, know, you want something from the state, the state has an absolute right to come into your home to find out how many TV sets you have, uh, what, what, is your, what your sofa looks like, and so on. Because we are giving you something, we want every piece of information about you. In other countries, in other countries it is demeaning to have somebody come into your house and look at this. And, and it will not be accepted. The UK is an example where means testing is thought to be <laughs> uh, 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 undignified. Okay? And, and it varies from country to country. So the other issue that I'm saying is that the economics of it, yeah, it varies, but it's relatively uniform. 
the economics of efficiency analysis, so whether this form is more efficient than that, whether the leaky buckets are fewer, the leakage is fewer here than, is, I know, I know there are variations, but it's more or less, economic analysis is more or less uniform. What's not uniform is the social acceptability of different forms of transfer. And that, uh, that is where I think what social science has to be doing. The social science has to be asking the question, how do we design mechanisms of redistribution which combine economic efficiency with social acceptability? And if the socially acceptable method is not the most economically efficient, well, we have to face up to those, to those trade-offs. Uh, and, and, but, but that is what social science analysis is for. And we have to experiment. You know, there, I mean, I, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, the, in the report and elsewhere, so let me just uh, run through this. So, this one. so here are different forms. Okay? There's cash transfers, there's basic income, conditional cash transfers, etc. As I said, economics has little, if anything, to say on social acceptability of different forms of redistribution. I want to give you an example of, uh, of uh, a particular type of transfer mechanism uh, to see how social science can be used to assess whether something is appropriate or not, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, etc. Because I do believe, given these uncertainties, the institutional innovations will require experimentation. We'll have to try out different methods, see whether it works or not. And when you do experimentation, when you try out different methods, you have to build in the evaluation right at the start. You can't sort of say, well, I'm going to do it, and then afterwards think about evaluation. It has to be built in right at the start. The example I want to give you is Mexico's Progresa program. It's, pro it's a program of conditional cash transfers. And some of you will know about it. Uh, it was a program set up in the 1990s, and it has essentially gone on. It's now, it has different names called Oportunidades now, but it used to be called Progresa. <clears throat> and the idea was, was, was the following. That actually they, they found that uh, uh, although schooling up to the age of 14 or so was okay in Mexico, there was a severe drop-off after 14, 15. Okay? Because kids were needed to work in the, in the poor households, were needed to work in the, in the, in the, fa in the family, in, in the farm, in the factories, and so on and so forth, to earn money. So they designed a system of conditional cash transfers, which is conditional on the child being in school, cash is transferred to the mother, actually to the mother in this, uh, in this setting. But you want to be able to evaluate whether this has worked or not. And you can't do it after, the, after, you've, after you've set it up. And as you all know, as many of you will know, there's a problem with evaluation of programs. There's a problem with evaluating a before and after or a with and without. Because there's a problem, as again, uh, uh, to use a phrase which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, of program endogeneity. What is that? It's supposed to give you an example. Suppose there's a very dynamic village head. And the, suppose the, the village with the program has a dynamic village head, and the village without the program does not have a dynamic village head. You don't know whether the program was there because this dynamic village head used his or her contacts to get the program there. And you don't then want to misattribute the improvements of, let's say, social indicators in this village compared to that one. Okay? You don't want to misattribute that to the program, but actually, the village head, not only did he get the program there, he was also working away to improve these, uh, these indicators. In, in order to separate out the causality, whether this program worked or not, you have to really do quasi-experimental design. And that's what Santiago Levy did in Mexico. Santiago Levy was a professor of economics at Boston University. He was called by the president of Mexico, <laughs> said, I want you here to design progress our scheme. Santiago Levy, in many ways, is the, is the technical father of uh, Progresa. Uh, uh, Ernesto Zedillo, the president, is the political father of, uh, uh, of Progresa. What they did was that they designed, they, they, desi they, they set up the evaluation at the same time, before the program. And the way they did it, it was very cleverly done, quasi-experimental design, which is that you couldn't, you couldn't have this program uh, 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 simultaneously overnight. It had to be rolled out. And the way it was rolled out was, it was argued, more or less random. Okay. So it wasn't that we went to the richest districts first, et cetera. It was more to do with various administrative things. So you could argue that the placement of the program was more or less random of this, and that's why they developed a quasi-experimental design. Uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute did the analysis and came up with very, very good results in terms, of, in terms of this. And it was that evaluation which meant that when the next government came in, when the Vincente Fox government uh, came in, 
you know, in Mexico, it's basically when the new government comes in, uh, everything that the previous government did is sort of junked. Okay, this is a, this is a rubbish stuff. This was a program that was kept. <laughs> the name was changed <laughs> from Progresa, sort of from a left-leaning government, to Oportunidades from a more right-leaning government. But the essence of the program was kept. So again, contribution of social science, very, very important here. I want to uh, the last thing I want to take, talk about is institutional innovation too, which is uh, a completely different area, which is repurposing the World Bank. In 1944, Actually, a few, uh, a few weeks after the D-Day landings, uh, a group of people met at the Bretton Woods, uh, Bretton Woods Hotel in, uh, at the, uh, in, in New Hampshire to essentially to design the post-war world, to design the economics of the post-war world. The British delegation was headed by John Maynard Keynes, the same person who wrote that thing about the end of the First World War. Okay. The US delegation was headed by Harry Dexter White, who was Roosevelt's right-hand man, both economists. And they essentially sat down and designed uh, the world order for the next uh, uh, however many years. The two key institutions that emerged were the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The IMF was charged with managing the world's exchange rates and the World Bank with reviving investment in the, in the, in the, in the, in the war-torn war economies of Europe and Japan. Keynes designed the so-called sovereign loan instrument. It's a sovereign loan instrument. It's a loan to a country. And the loan is guaranteed by the governments of the world. It was that design which got over the commercial risk factor, which then meant that Wall Street was willing to lend to these countries because those loans were guaranteed by the governments of the world. It's a sovereign loan with so-called so severally and jointly guaranteed. It was a brilliant design of a, of a financial instrument. And essentially, this was brilliantly successful and contributed greatly to the post-war economic boom the world over. The revival of France, Germany, of Europe, and so on, uh, and, and Japan owes a lot. I mean, there are many other factors, of course, I know owes a lot to this type of design of an institution targeted to a particular problem. Well, in fact, it was so successful <laughs> that it was replicated. And now uh, the Asian Development Bank, for example, has the same type of loan instrument. The Inter-American Development Bank, which is a Latin American bank, has the same instrument. African Development has the same instrument and so on. So in fact, the World Bank has been the victim of its own success because <laughs> everybody else is now doing the same thing. And of course, private capital has also uh, increased. So what's happened is that the World Bank is actually now a very small player <laughs> in the world, in the world which it helped to create, uh, so to speak, because there are so many other institutions playing this game. But could it be repurposed to address the problems of today? Not the problems of bombed out infrastructure in Europe, but the problems of today, in particular the problems of global public goods. Okay. There are these many issues of climate change, etc. We have, we have, uh, uh, and we have a global institution that is looking for a purpose. It has lost its purpose from, uh, from where it was before. Okay. And the answer to my mind, and I've written about this, is yes, potentially. But it needs institutional innovation to bring this institution, the World Bank, into the age in which we now live and for the purpose for which it might now be best suited. What do I mean by that? Well, remember who designed the World Bank. It was the US and the UK, the major victorious powers at the end of the Second World War. Okay? Uh, and, the powers and, and the voting structures, the governance structures of the World Bank reflect the world of 1944, the world of 1945, not the world of, the, of, uh, uh, of 2010, not the world of 2019, which will be 75, uh, 75 years after the Bretton Woods Conference. Okay? The US is, in fact, the largest shareholder. Not only is the US the largest shareholder, it has veto power. Because the, the articles say that you need 85% you need of the vote to change the charter, and the US has 17% of the vote. Okay? And the US will, will not, certainly not under the current administration, give up uh, uh, its voting power to allow other countries to come up. In other words, it is not willing to give up the voting power to reflect the economic reality, the economic power of today. And that's the basic institutional governance issue that we now face. That the power, that the governance structure of this major global institution, which was brilliantly successful, but now needs to be repurposed for, for global public goods, is, does not reflect the current uh, power structures in the world. And what's happened is that countries have tried to go outside it. Indeed, the Asian Development Bank, 
was led by Japan. China has formed the I Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, and India has joined China in forming the New Development Bank. So new institutions are forming <laughs> to get around a power structure which reflects 1944. But why not change that governance structure to purpose this institution, which is a truly global institution? The Asian Development Bank is not a global institution. The Asian Infrastructure Bank is not, bank is not a global institution. The New Development Bank represents the BRICS countries and is not a global institution. But in order to do that, you need to change the institutional power structures. Institutional innovation is at the heart of this, uh, uh, of this problem. So let me conclude. The last 75 years have seen enormous progress in many dimensions. Yet we live in an anxious age. The reason is that there are various chasms that are opening up in front of us. Okay. So even though we're doing very well, thank you, you can just see these drops coming in the future. And among these chasms, I've talked about rising inequality, environmental and climate catastrophes, and the pressures on the nation state. Institutional innovations in many dimensions are needed if we are to traverse these chasms before us. Examples of such innovations include new forms of redistribution to address inequality and repurposing of old global institutions like the World Bank for the new realities. The report that I started off with, the IPSP report, contains, of course, much broader analysis of this and many, many more ideas on such innovations. I hope you will uh, get a chance to read it. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as you and I were talking about upstairs, I think um, economists have been doing really interesting things in the podcast space recently. Uh, and one uh, recently, I don't remember if it was Planet Money or 99% visible or something, but um, they talked about, I think Finland, um, within the past 10 years, did an experiment in uh, guaranteed basic income. Um, it may have been another skin in the game, I don't remember. But um, they actually have a specific department in their government that is like the Bureau of Experimental Policies or something like that. Um, uh, and it is from a design background, and so their whole purpose is they take a segment of the population and they run an experiment on them, and then they decide if they want to make that a policy. One of the issues that they brought up, which was interesting, was that um, it does bring up some questions about can we do that in a democratic state because the premise of democracy is that all men are created equal, but the premise of an experiment is that there are two unequal groups. Um, and, and I think that is particularly difficult to address in America, both because of the sheer size of the country as well as the um, political discourse right now. And you know, Finland, it's much easier to do an experiment in universal basic income than it would be in Alabama. How would you address um, sort of those, like if we want to do more experimental policy work in the United States, which I think is necessary, especially if we're going to make the changes that you think we need to do, how would you address the issue of inequality that's inherent with it? Oh, it's, a very, it's a very, very good question, and, I, uh, and of course, one faces these issues uh, uh, all, all the time, actually, in this, uh, in this sort of setting. So there's a, there's a certain fashion, in, particularly in my area, development economics, for randomized control trials, uh, where one thinks one's in a lab, and you have two Petri dishes, and you, psk, you put something in one and through a pipette, and you don't in the other one, and the green stuff grows on this. So they, well, it must be the stuff that I put in the Petri dish. That's, that's the basic logic of these sorts of things. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there are all sorts of general methodological issues which I won't get into, internal validity, external validity, but you're raising, uh, you're raising sort of ethical issues about these, about these, sorts, of, these sorts of experiments. Um, and and I, th I, think you're, I think you're quite right. Particularly policy experiments of, of this type. So remember I talked about the progressive thing. <laughs> they didn't say we're gonna, give these, uh, we're gonna give these districts this thing and not those districts. It emerged out of an administrative process which was, which was accepted by the political party. So I think that's quite, that's quite important. There was another uh, example of this. Uh, in India, for example, the, the uh, constitutional amendment uh, mandated that uh, in terms of rural, uh, rural village uh, uh, gram panchayat, so to speak, that 30, uh, 33 and a third percent of them would be, uh, head, would be headed by women. Well, it's all very well to have that, but how do you actually implement this? How do you actually implement it? Well, in the state of West Bengal, uh, when we started the thing, uh, the, the civil servants said, well, how do we implement this? They said, well, I, no, I know what we'll do. We'll, we'll give a number to each of them, uh, and they will pick a number at random, and then every third one will go. So essentially, they pick randomly. <laughs> they, that's the, and Esther Duflo knew institutionally this was what was going on, 
And so she immediately did surveys in those that, those that had, uh, the women had those that didn't. So you had a randomized, in effect, a randomized quasi-experiment in this, in this thing. So I would say that uh, the ethical issues are extremely important in this thing. And the role of social science is, well, if you, if you cannot do, quote, unquote, pure randomized, how do you actually uh, then use the methods of social science to get inference out of it? So this is a very live area uh, just now. Yeah. Uh, 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 yes, then we'll go to that slide. Yes. I know there's arguments for the unemployment rate being fractionally uh, affected, but within the scope, um, having a social science where you know Roosevelt was in '33 saying we need a subsistence level. How do we translate that to this century? And what are the markers if we are to uh, integrate this administratively? You know, doing it year by year, would we have an impact if we integrated this, not just the subsistence level or living wage, but a living standard that the country should have? Well, how would you oh, wow. So this is a, again, <laughs> these, these are really important, uh, but really complex, complex questions. Let me take the minimum wage one narrowly uh, first, for, uh, the narrow minimum wage question. Okay? And I've actually personally done a fair amount of work on this uh, in, the developing country, in the developing country context. Okay? Uh, not, I haven't worked so much on the US. And, uh, but uh, I would say that our, our bottom line, and there's a paper in the World Bank Research Observer, which you can go and have a look at and so on, in terms of minimum wages in Africa, et cetera, is, <clears throat> is that there is no uniform rule in this thing that minimum wages are good or bad. Okay? That you re context really, really does matter. In particular, from basic economic theory, it matters what the nature of the labor market is. Is, it, is the nature of the labor market competitive or is it monopsonistic? Okay? That, that makes a real difference uh, to your assessment of what the minimum wage does and so on. So that's one point. The second point, which may be more important in a developing country context than here, is that enforcement matters. Okay? You can pass whatever minimum wage <laughs> law you like. If it's not enforced, then it's as though it wasn't, it wasn't there. And what's interesting is that, is that those who support the minimum wage and those who oppose the minimum wage both talk as though it was perfect enforcement of the minimum wage. Okay? Uh, because of course, if it, didn't, if it wasn't enforced, then they wouldn't be a val it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a debate. It, it's as though it wasn't, it wasn't there. So what's quite interesting then is, is how come in some situations it's enforced more than in others? What's the, what's the analytics behind that? What's the theory? What does a government think it's doing when it passes a minimum wage, which it knows it's not going to enforce 100%? Does that make rational sense or not? So, so that's another class of, class of issues that, 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 that arises in this, uh, in, this, in this setting. And actually, the detail of enforcement is also quite important as well. I, I may be drifting a little bit, because it's, <laughs> it's my research area. But the detail of enforcement is quite interesting as well. We have a paper with, with, the, with the title, Turning a Blind Eye. Okay? So basically, you look the other way. Uh, and it turns out that when unemployment rates are high, say in South Africa, uh, uh, in periods that they're high, labor inspectors tend to overlook violations of minimum wage. Because they have a theory, they have a model in their mind that actually if I enforce this, this person will be thrown out, thrown out of a job. So whatever you as an economist is analyzing, the labor inspector has a view at the back of their mind that this is, what, this is what's uh, going on. So that's so far as the minimum wage is concerned. Uh, in, in, ter in, terms of, in terms of linking uh, the minimum national standard to this, that's again raised uh, raise a very interesting set of questions about, there's a debate about whether the basic, basic income uh, is enough by itself, or whether it should be supplemented by a minimum wage, or whether in fact the minimum wage should be our lead policy, and then do supplementary through income transfers. Okay? And you can see the two views. Basic minimum wage, it, it, depends on, it depends on what people believe is fair and just. Okay? So if in, if in some countries, if it, the, the notion is, this is my right as a citizen to have this. If that is a mindset, fine, there's no loss of dignity in receiving, to receiving that. But on the other hand, if the, if the view, not only amongst the givers, but the receivers, so to speak, is this is charity. Okay? That this is something that's, that's whatever, it's like just getting, a, it's, just, it's just you now get the welfare check through. If that is the, if that is the mindset, okay, then no matter what we talk, uh, say about efficient, economic efficiency of this versus that and so on, and there are questions about economic efficiency, fiscal exposure and so on, we can have those debates to, to our heart's content. 
but it's the social acceptability of that which is which is uh, which is crucial. Yes. Uh, yes, please. I found your point on the work that poetry and you would have students. Right. So again, uh, so this is really what I what I was saying about the governance structures of the World Bank. Uh, if if we want, uh, so we don't want to go. We don't want to relitigate the Washington Consensus sort of uh, debates and so on. Although what's quite interesting is that in the first thirty years of its existence, thirty five years, the World Bank was actually quite interventionist. <laughs> yeah, it was actually quite Keynesian. John Maynard Keynes was a <laughs> founder of it. Okay. So uh, uh, it, it supported industrialization. It supported this, it supported that. It supported high tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. And it was reflecting the thinking of its time, the accepted thinking of its time in some sense. And of course, then in the 1980s and 90s, that shifted. Uh, and we, ha and we, had what we, we had what we had. Now, now it's shifted again. <laughs> okay, now it's shifted again. Uh, uh, the, the greatest emphasis on inequality that I see emerging, actually, uh, is actually from the IMF. Uh, uh, the, the best pieces of economic writing on inequality <laughs> are actually coming from the IMF these days. You know, so, the world, so one shouldn't be fighting, first of all, one shouldn't be fighting yesterday's battles, so to speak. Okay? In fact, even yesterday's battles were <laughs> different from the day before's battles and so on. So we, we, the, the reality is what, it is what it is today. What I was getting at more was that here we have an institution. Here we have a global institution with the cogs are sort of working away and so on. Uh, it's not doing what it was meant to do. Uh, as designed by Keynes. But could we envisage, or do we just not simply scrap this? Uh, because clearly the Asian Development Bank is not going to do for global public goods, that's Asian, uh, and so on. And the Inter-American Development Bank is not going to do for world global public goods, because that, that's Latin American and so on. But we have here a genuine global institution. <laughs> but it has all the problems of it in the sense that it reflects the power structures of, of, uh, of uh, 1945. So that's how I was putting the problem before us uh, in this. Uh, uh, yes, on this side. Yes, please. So Modi's uh, demonstration in India has got a lot of criticism, <laughs> yes. both India and abroad. Um, and he's rebuttal that, and it's not now that uh, we'll see effects, but it's not in years. Do you think that's a fair assumption to say? Okay, so Modi. <laughs> uh, let me, in, in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> uh, let me say that he's not my man. <laughs> Uh, and I'm certainly not his man. Uh, so, but let's, let's uh, I mean, no, again, I, I mentioned the rise of Hindu nationalism, fundamentalism in, 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 as one of the areas that, uh, that, are, that are the anxieties of our age. But leave that to one side. Let's fo focus narrowly on the demonetization exercise that, that, that happened. Uh, and from what you say, if, if it is true that what we're, in some sense he is therefore accepting <laughs> that in a fairly narrow economic sense, uh, the experiment failed. He's saying, well, wait for, 100, <laughs> wait for it for 100 years and so on and so forth. Who knows? Who knows, OK? So, uh, but but just, to, just let's think through the, the sense in which that experiment failed. Okay? As you know, what it was was demonetization of 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes. Okay? <clears throat> and the big selling point, and, and, and what was interesting, and this completely uh, flummoxed all social scientists was that after this thing, which all of us argued would be bad for the poor, he then won the next state election in the biggest state in India, UP, 110 million, 120 million people uh, uh, with a landslide. Okay? Now, of course, he played the ethnic, he played the communal religious card in that state and so on, but again, leave that to one side. Uh, somehow, exactly your story that, that this is, this, this is going to hit corruption somehow. Uh, uh, somehow rang true to people. Of course, it didn't. In reality, it didn't. Because the way that it works was that so-called mules were, all, <laughs> were used by the people who had these, these uh, large amount of cash. Because you, you could go to the bank as an individual, 
and get small amounts of money changed. So you, know, you get 1,000 people, each with 5,000 rupees, to go to the bank and get, get, get small. So in fact, in fact, black money was whitened in this thing. Money that was previously black, so to speak, through this method was actually channeled back into legal, into legal form. And, the, and uh, one story is that, of course, uh, uh, that his political party was aware of this. <laughs> And they were ready with this thing. The other political party wasn't aware of this and wasn't ready to do this, uh, to do this mule type, uh, type stuff. Uh, I mean, from an economic analysis point of view, you could have said that this is going to hurt the informal sector. It's going to hurt the poor. It's going to hurt the small businesses and so on and so forth. And indeed, as indeed it did in this. Uh, so I don't know on what economic basis then one can argue that this is going to be good for the next. Uh, in, uh, we'll know the answer to this in 100 years. I, I, I don't know what the quote is. but. Uh, so, but all the economic analysis <laughs> that seems to suggest is this notion that you're going to just overnight demonetize rather than through an organic process of development that actually cash is replaced by, by banking and, and so on. And you can have policy interventions there, which there are many policy interventions in the Indian context, which, which try to encourage banking in rural areas, et cetera. But the notain of demonetizing overnight, uh, certain, that's, that is not the sort of experiment <laughs> that, we, that we want to try. But indeed, that experiment, I would say, has failed. But, but that's my. Uh, yes, uh, maybe, maybe that will be last one, Antonio. Is it? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, it's not that clear to me what factors we will bring uh, inequality up, because we have like, many interacting uh, factors, such as and I just brought a couple of them, wages, uh, interest rates, prices, and population growth. Maybe if you could explain to us like uh, in more detail, what will be the main factors that will indeed uh, drive the equality of? Well, I, as I said, I think the, the basic, so cons consider the following. They start off, do the following thought experiment. Start off with, uh, with the current situation. And all of a sudden, suppress demand for basic labor. And shoot up demand for highly educated labor. Okay? If the supply side has remained unchanged, which it will in the short run, uh, uh, wages on the skills side will rise because you've just shut up the demand for that side. Okay? Whereas on this side, the basic labor side, either you'll get unemployment of these people or uh, employment at lower wages. So either of these, on either of these two mechanisms, you're going to get a widening of these, uh, of these gaps. So that's the basic picture. Okay? Just, uh, I don't know those of you who uh, uh, are old enough to remember those black and white movies of South Korea's industrialization, where there are these movies and factories uh, shoe factories, okay, there were hundreds of workers on assembly lines uh, 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 gluing on heels to shoes as they came along. Okay? That was the basis of South Korea's industrialization, labor-intensive manufactured exports 60 years ago. Okay? But we're in a different world today. Those shoes are being manufactured by uh, the three people behind a, behind a glass pane, and uh, everything is being done. So, with that sort of view, the demand for those three people behind the, pe behind the pane of glass is very high. What's happened to all those people who were previously uh, 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 gluing on those uh, things? And of course, South Korea is a different story now, but, the no uh, but, uh, the, but it, it is happening uh, around the world, including, of course, in this, in this country as well. So that would be the fundamental aspect that, I was that I'll be talking about. But that's market income. And of course, to market income, you have to add uh, what the government then does. Uh, you added household size and so on, so it's, it's complicated. But I think, what is the fundamental force that's driving it? And that's what I was trying to highlight in, this, uh, um, in the talk. Any other questions, comments? Yes, last one, yes, please. Uh, I have a question regarding birth rates. Uh, we've had a, a lot of changes in a lot of uh, Western countries and uh, Asia and the US and, and Europe, you're having fertility rates drop to historic lows. I think Asia still remains uh, higher. Uh, how does that affect, in the long run, the, uh, the demand for labor and the availability of labor? And how will that impact any type of solution that you put in today? Again, a very, very, very good point. I didn't have time to cover that. The, but demographic trends are, of course, a, a fundamental uh, force that's driving the thing. And maybe your question, the, the Karim, was the, well, what? Uh, shouldn't I be putting together the demand side story with the supply side stories? And, and, that's, and that's a fair point and a, fa a fair, fair observation. So <clears throat> let, me, let me say two things. Firstly, in terms of the broad global trend, okay, uh, the demographic trend, one would say, broadly speaking, 
is indeed of falling fertility, uh, of aging populations, declining, uh, uh, increasing dependency ratios, etc. And you can see that you can see that very clearly manifested in Japan and uh, 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 and so on. But uh, overlaid or overlaid on that broad trend are tremendous variations at country at country levels. Okay. So uh, again, I, I don't need to. The, the, the demographic bulge is going through into different parts in different different parts of the, different parts of the world. China has already passed it. China population is already starting to age. India is still coming. Uh, Africa is still is still coming. And Europe, of course, uh, we we know the, we know the story. So I would say that the story would be uh, not uh, that the global trend is relatively clear, uh, and that has that has implications in in, uh, in terms of future. So one, one could say, all right, so uh, we have. Uh, we have demand for basic labor falling, uh, but you know uh, there are going to be fewer of them because they'll all now be <laughs> older. Eh, you know, uh, true, true. Uh, but I still believe that that fundamental force will be will be will be important in the next 30 to 35 years in terms of the re redistribution type. The real issue, I think, is going to be uh, uh, mismatches, so to speak, <laughs> between the demographic bulge in some countries and the and the aging in, aging in other countries. And one could argue. <laughs> Uh, well, what would be a conventional economist's way of saying you, you bridge this gap? The, the answer is let the labor market work and let migration take place. So economists in general are very strongly in favor of cross-border migration. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, the populations of countries, uh, certainly the receiving countries, are not uh, in favor. So there's a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a debate going on amongst, and, and I'm certainly on the side of people who say, of economists who say that we should be opening out borders exactly to address a mismatch. And that's a very conventional economic way of approaching. But social scientists more broadly would say, no, this can actually lead to tensions. Uh, and do, do you really want that? And so, on. so well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>